Traders are on alert as we get closer to the SEC's January 10th deadline to approve spot Bitcoin ETFs. Joining us now with more on the various regulatory outcomes that could impact crypto trades, Anthony Pompliano, founder and partner at Pomp Investment. Anthony, good to see you this morning. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So I have to just dial back. I go back to when the SPY was listed 30 plus years ago. I covered it then. The USO, the oil ETF, the gold e trust in 04 and 06. There was never anything like this anticipation. We didn't. We don't talk about ETF launches and who the authorized participants are. This is yeah. bureaucratic back office stuff. It's just how the how the trades function. So the, all of which is to say, the degree of anticipation of this and how it's made its way into the market is extreme. How is it not just a anticlimax when it happens? Wall Street is getting invited in anticipation of the greatest show on earth. Right. Bitcoin has been the best performing asset for the last 15 years, and Wall Street's basically been boxed out of it. They haven't had access to this asset. And so I think that's what you're seeing in that pent up um, excitement. One thing that I do caution these Wall Street investors is you can't trade this like other assets. We saw just yesterday about a billion dollars of open interest got wiped out. The guys over at Reflexivity Research did a fantastic job outlining saying, you know, this asset in 2021 went up almost 800 percent from uh, before the pandemic started to the kind of the top of the market. Yeah. During that time, there was five 30 percent drawdowns. If you're going to try to get levered long and think that, hey, ETF gets approved and this thing just goes to the moon, you're likely to get shaken out or get liquidated. That is really good advice. Just beware the volatility. That comes the, I mean, this thing is, is on a risk return basis. It's the, by far the most attractive asset in all the financial markets, but it comes with tons and tons of volatility. And so if you go back to 2017, it was $1,000. We're up 45x since 2017. But along the way, we've had two 80 percent drawdowns. A plethora. I can't even count how many, you know, 30 plus percent drawdowns. And so Wall Street is saying, hey, the ETF's coming. Here we go. Now, I do think over a long period of time, Bitcoin's price is going to continue to go up. We're going to have a persistent bid from all these ETFs. Another thing people aren't talking about, everyone's talking about the primary uh, fund flows. So retail or institutions buying this ETF. But actually what we're starting to see now is other publicly listed funds or ETFs are changing their prospectus to say that they can put up to 15 percent of their AUM in the Bitcoin yeah. ETF. So if you have the best performing asset and you've got an ETF that's lagging, why would you not put you Bitcoin know, in your ETF? But all of this really formalizes the greater fool aspect of why Bitcoin should go up, right? <laughs> it's just there's more there, there are more people who are going to get in there and buy and they have a new easy way to do it. Meanwhile, it, it's easier to own Bitcoin directly than it was to own a barrel of oil or a gold bar or a futures contract. When those things were introduced, it didn't change the overall price curve. I think there's two points that you're making. First is when you buy the CTF, you are not buying Bitcoin. You are buying exposure to Bitcoin. But if you want to actually own Bitcoin, take self-custody, you should definitely go do that and not do it through the ETF. The second thing, though, is this kind of greater fool theory. One thing I always say to people is, what is the most valuable commodity in the world? In my opinion, it's computing power. Bitcoin is the strongest computer network in the world. And so when you're buying Bitcoin, you're buying an asset that is backed by the strongest commodity in the world. So when you start to think of it from that perspective, yes, it is internet native. Yes, it is for this kind of digital generation. But those people don't look at oil or or gold or anything else is the most valuable commodity, they look at computing power, and that's why Bitcoin's so attractive to them. Can I ask you a very simple question? If I own Bitcoin through an ETF, do I have greater protection of my ownership of that Bitcoin interest than I did through some of the exchanges where I've heard some nasty stories? So it, you definitely have the exposure, and obviously it's a regulated entity. Uh, you have the ETF structure, all the things that I think Wall Street really enjoys about the protections of those regulated, uh, regulated funds. Uh, what you don't have, though, is direct exposure and ownership of Bitcoin itself. So one of the beauties of Bitcoin is similar to cash. You can go to the ATM, you can take the cash out of the machine. With Bitcoin, you can actually take self-custody. You can own it. You don't have to rely on any counterparty. You don't have to rely on an exchange. You don't have to rely on an ETF uh, provider, et cetera. And so people have to ask themselves, what is my comfort level? Am I comfortable taking self custody or do I just want the financial exposure and I don't want to deal with that and I think that that's where you're going to see a lot of people who have been sitting on the sidelines institutions they can't take self-custody they need the ETF to be able to actually allocate to the asset hey Anthony the Coindesk the block a lot of different places are reporting on this matrix port report um, from an analyst who says that the SEC is going to say forget it they're going to reject the ETF the spot Bitcoin ETF proposal I know you think that's a real long shot what would happen if they actually did do that, if the SEC said no? If they approve it, I think that there will be a lot of short-term volatility, and then we'll kind of get right back on track, whether it goes up or down after the approval. If they reject it, I think the same thing would happen. There would be a lot of kind of short-term volatility, and we'd get right back on track. The beauty is with Bitcoin, if we go back, we, we saw something like this. China had over 60 percent of all mining inside of their borders. They completely banned mining and kicked them all out. 50 percent of the hash rate went offline. 
by the end of that year, May of 2021 is when it happened, by the end of 2021, mining hash rate was back to an all-time high. And so this thing is just resilient, it's anti-fragile, and it continues to just do what it was designed to do. But that's true, although the risk-reward, you know, the, 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 the returns based uh, per unit of volatility you cite, it really depends on the starting point. Right. I mean, two and a half years ago, you were here. You were saying one hundred thousand dollars really soon. We're going to get there on Bitcoin. And it's been nothing through this inflationary spike and a Fed tightening cycle. I, I always say, look, at eight thousand dollars. Right. I thought I was going to one hundred. It only went to 70. I was yeah. off. I was off by a little bit. Right. Um, but but in terms of I, th I think these directional moves, again, it goes back to there is a lot of volatility here. Yeah. And I do think that the volatility will dampen as obviously ETFs and kind of more persistent sticky holders come into the market. But remember, we not, aren't just talking about an ETF either. We also have the having that's coming up at the beginning yeah. of Q2, and we've got to return back to loose monetary policy. And so I think that we're going to see a pretty a significant move in Bitcoin. Just don't expect it to go from 45000 to a million tomorrow. Right.